Okay, so I, I have a question to start with. And I don't know who should answer this, but um, I guess the, the general question is, um, how, how the heck do you do that? You know, Because when I'm sitting there, I, I feel like I, I'm going through so many different kinds of thoughts and I'm paying attention, I'm not paying attention, I'm spacing out, I'm seeing colors, I'm hallucinating. We're spacing out. <laughs> what? How, how do you do it? How do you keep the concentration? How, what, what is going on through your mind while you're there's, doing it? There's a lot of, there are many different uh, uh, color, colors of highlighting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's like yellow, there's pink, there's orange. <laughs> I mean, go ahead. Well, also, Feldman helps us because he changes the meter almost every bar or every other bar. So you can't really stop counting or space, you can't space up because you'll miss a meter change. So it's a really, it's a really nice way of him to keep our brains in the game by constantly changing meter. <laughs> At least I feel that way. However, the, the, the changes of meter is his way of writing phrasing. Because it's like, wait, this is a little longer, and this is a little shorter. It's, it's very, very subtle. I don't know if the audience could hear that. Can, can you? Because, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, right? that's his way of like, like writing rubato. But it's also the way of making sure that we can't completely space it out. Right. You know, so I mean, what you're saying about how it makes it um, so that you have to be on the edge of your seat, you know, I think listening, you feel that. You feel um, intensely concentrated. So, um, so that's, to me, that's kind of the paradox of the piece is it's incredible um, um, gentleness, but also it has these tiny little microscopic rough edges which um, pop up in the notes and the way the notes conflict with each other and the way the rhythms change every, every measure, basically. Um, so you hear all these things that are um, endless repeats which are not exact. That's right, yeah. So, which is, um, it seems like a huge amount of effort um, for the smallest amount of difference. So, but it's really beautiful. Um, does someone have a question for these people? <clears throat> not really a question for the music, but something about the program notes, which I do not understand. Is that if you listen to these, um, I think, let me just read it. Uh-oh. Uh, it says, it, um, oh, it is a common place for people to remark about how beautiful the surfaces of these pieces are. What does this mean, the surface of the music? Well, I wrote the program note. So sometimes when people talk about surface in music, they're talking about just sort of like the general notes themselves, that, they're, that the notes themselves are, um, are diatonic, they're close together, they're, um, the surface of this, you know, there's not a lot of um, vibrato, there's not a lot of action, there's not a lot of counterpoint. It's very simple music. So, but if you compare the kind of, um, sim so we would, we would say that that's the surface of the music, the very first thing that's presented to you is this surface. But underneath that is um, the fact that these very simple things are clashing with each other in very subtle ways. But so, there was a follow-up sentence said that you should notice what's missing or what's absent in the Okay. Well, there's some things that, that we normally do in a piece of music to, to chart our course. If you notice, there was no melody. There was no moment. You know, there's one incredible pizzicato tune of yours, but what's really interesting about this tune, right, where you hear the cello pizzicato is, it's not a tune that's designed so that you remember it, so that you can chart its course through the piece, so that you can say, oh, that's the melody that everything is based on. It's something that draws attention to itself to say, here's a moment which is interesting, but it also goes out of its way to make sure that you can't hold it. And to me, that's one of the things that's really kind of interesting about this is all the stuff which we use normally to go through a piece of music that this avoids. Yeah, it's a, um, well, I would just say that, uh, you know, the. 
um, the scale of the music has a, something a lot to do with what David's writing in those notes, which is that um, if we present it, uh, just if we took any like four bars and just presented presented it to you, you would have one impression. But after you've been sitting there for an hour, the effect that this so small change has on you is very different. So on a surface level, it looks a certain way, but after having sat there and listened for a while, it has a very different emotional impact on you, I think. To me, one of the interesting things about that is that there are details in this music that in other people's music I would miss, because they would just be things that would come um, uh, in the course of all sorts of other dramatic things. So something that got exciting, something that got tragic, something that got fast, something that got slow. I wouldn't really care so much that, oh, this note came in a little bit later this time than it came in the measure before. Or these two notes that were putting, that, that came in and clashed, one of them changed. You know, all these little tiny details somehow after, um, after all this time. I mean, I think one of the interesting things for me about this music is I, I find that I spend the first half hour of all of these pieces um, resisting listening to it. You know, I try to fight it. I, I, I go, I, I, can't, I can't go through this again. You know, I, I can't listen to this microscopically. I can't suppress this so much, you know. And then I start thinking about, um, you know, my day and my laundry and, you know, um, my bills. And then after a while you go, uh, I've gone through everything I can think of and the piece is still there. <laughs> um, and it sort of fights you then to sort of take it on its level. And then at that moment is when all these incredibly beautiful things happen that are unexpected, when you start playing chords together. When, when the, I mean to me always one of the most beautiful things that happens in the piece is when the speed of the arpeggios changes about two thirds of the way through. And you just go, oh, are we going half speed now? What, what happened, you know? Um, but I wouldn't notice that in a, in, a, in a normal piece of music. I wouldn't notice it in a different kind of music. Um, I, I suppose to a certain degree, some of the things that we're talking about here have to do with this question of it being like objectified in a certain way. And you speak about that in the program note as well. And I, I suppose I, I wonder, like, like this question of like, describing a surface is sort of a, a, like the surface of an object or something. And I, I suppose I wonder as you're performing, this is a question for, your, for the five on stage, I mean, to what degree do you feel objectified as a performer or, or to what degree do you feel that your parts have a, have a sense of like, oh, this is an aspect of this object or, I don't know, I was just curious to yeah, speak question. to that. That's a really, that's a really good question. <laughs> it's a really I, good question I, that I, no one wants to I, answer. I sort of, I feel very, uh, I go really in and out of feeling very exposed, like that if I um, do anything physically or with my face, I'm going to ruin the music. Um, so like, and then, and then you're very conscious of your body over a sl slow period of time. So then, um, you know, you start thinking like that, you know, the way that I move, I'm, I'm too hunched over, I need to sit up straight and like, you know, think about my sound. And so it's all these like very, these things that you're very aware that the audience is watching, but I don't want the audience to watch really. Mm -hmm. I want the audience to be lost in the, in the sound and in the object, but mm -hmm. you can't help it. It's like sort of what we're doing, we're doing it for a really long time, so this would be kind of cool to look at, like watching us decay. I mean, when we play, um, <laughs> You know, the second string quartet, which lasts for five and a half hours, it's even like sort of more extreme watching us fall apart on stage. But I really want to try to avoid, in my head, I'm trying to stop you from thinking about that. Um, uh, my, respond to, my response to your question is, is quite different. Um, um, like, I mean, the key word in your question is the word object. So I'd like to ask you a question. Do, do you hear geometry in this music? Because that's what, like, you know, because, like, throughout the music, we, it's con the music is constructed of very, very stripped down, like, motive, okay? But then this motive, like, expands and contracts. Like, I, I think it's like a shape 
that, I don't know, it, it starts, it begins as a, um, like, let's say it's, a, it's, it's five-sided, like pentagonal, and then, like, he adds another side, and then he takes, like, two sides away. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, is that, is that kind of, um, that's, that's kind of, I hear that in the music, and I, I hear, yeah, I hear something very geometric, very mathematical about the music. I think there's something, just if I can add one thing, that um, I think sort of enhances the object nature of the music, is that we're used to certain ornaments in music, certain things, um, crescendi and decrescendi and vibrato, and these are things that we, we see people adding them to the music as they play it in front of us. And I think we interpret those things as um, that's where people add emotion to the music. That's where the schmaltz you know, gets in. And that's also, I think we're used to interpreting those things as um, these are the keys that we use to get to the soul of the player or the soul of the piece. And this music tries very hard to avoid those things. Yeah. And so without those markers, which, which really we use to um, guide us to get emotional content, we don't necessarily feel comfortable getting emotional content from this music anymore that way. And so by taking that avenue away, we have to find some other way to get it. Yeah, I want to say, you know, also in answer to your question, and along with what David just said, it's, it's something I struggle with during the performance because for me anyway, this music is, is profoundly and deeply melancholy, but without a trace of sentimentality. And so um, just by playing the same chord twice and being a human being, I can't play it exactly the same, but then I'm constantly struggling with do I try to make it the same and just be completely um, a functionary of the chord, or do I let myself interpret it and play it a little bit differently the second time? And is that getting away from what he wants? And should I be more of an object? And so it's it's a constant um, struggle, but a really fascinating one. It's one of the things that I enjoy about playing this music. I have some questions on the performance side, especially for the string players. But sorry, would you mind just repeating that real quick? The microphone so oh. those in the back can hear you. Sorry, sorry, thank you so much. Um, just some questions for the on the performance side, especially for the string players. One thing that I was wondering about is again and again and again, you have to go from silence to playing, and you know, there's four of you. Um, it, it, is it a very challenging thing to coordinate? You know, how to do it together um, so that. You know, you're not coming in at slightly different times. I mean, do you have some sensation of like breathing together? And a, a, a related question is, with your choices with the bow stroke, um, do, do you try to choose? Or you could imagine you could give like a very dramatic attack. Do, do you try to choose not to do that so that you have more wiggle room? For yeah, we we try. I think we try to avoid that in this music because it's so subtle, and we try to avoid big movement. Um, and a lot of it is because it's, it, it sounds less complicated. The score is more complicated than it sounds, so we do have to cue a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of changes in the, um, in the speed of the music and the speed of the notes. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of it is just thinking, uh, thinking of the rhythm in your head and individually and then just following the person if you're supposed to play with them. And we also, we're all looking at scores, everyone's music, at the same time. So instead of just our individual parts, we, we look at everyone's music. Yeah, so we'd be telling somebody's mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> Usually. But the, I mean, the one, this, this, the, <laughs> this has nothing to do with what your question is, but I, like, I find the most frustrating thing about playing this is that after about an hour, you just want to play something really loud. <laughs> but you can't. You know, he won't let. They won't, he won't let. You. It's really frustrating. <laughs> um, just a, a related question about bow speed. I felt like um, some of you had different bow speeds. Like I, I wasn't paying super close attention, but it seemed like, for example, the first violinist, you, you did like you had like a pretty fast bow speed, maybe compared to the violist or something. It seemed to use maybe less of your bow or something. 
Do, do you all coordinate that, or, or is it just your nat the natural thing that comes? He has better that? control. <laughs> well, I mean, there's definitely um, there are subtle differences from like bottom up, but so um, we're going to use a different rate of speed, cello, viola, and so like so it's generally slower on the bottom, faster, the, the faster. thickness, of the, thickness of the string is one thing. Yeah. Um, but we do, I mean, we do try to play generally. We're trying to create a group sound, but there's, I mean, very subtly. I mean, David was talking about like the schmaltz. It's like by actually playing with a slightly faster bow speed or a slightly slower bow speed than everybody else, you're sort of highlighting a certain note in a way in the chord. Right. So I'm sort of thinking how I can influence the chord sometimes. That means slower and less sometimes that means faster. That's long line for us. Also the voicing of the, the yeah. notes. Certain certain notes need to be brought up, brought out more than others. So I found the notes quite illuminating. I'm not a musician, don't know how to interpret music, and I, I was wondering how does in, how does this piece address the first question or the second question? How long should a piece of music last? Because the experience. I mean, I, I agree that it more or less destroys your concept of time. Because the experience of this thing is like at some point you come to and it's like oh it's it's that again. And then you and then you have the feeling that this could as well go twice as long. Like I, I don't really. I don't, where does the decision come from, in your opinion, when to end it? And also, just a related question: I, I saw you perform a six-hour piece. How, how do you do that? What's that like? <laughs> well, we don't do it that often. <laughs> yeah, we played that one. Well, we played that how many times, Tom? 16 times. The, it's about five and a half hours. Um, the, the interesting about that piece is that uh, you hear themes in the first hour that don't come back until the fifth hour. <laughs> and it's, it's really amazing when that happens, actually. I, um, I would just say that, I mean, Feldman was, got really interested in the fact that uh, on classical music concerts, the piece of new music, what did he say? It was like 20, 20, minutes. 20 minutes. Another 20 minutes. And so he like, called up all his composer friends and was like, you write a new piece? Yeah, how long is it? Oh, about 20 minutes. And it's like, yeah, it's like about 20 minutes. And he just started being like, what the hell? So um, basically, he just he wanted to try to break the convention of the concert hall was one of his, one of his goals to kind of, he wanted it to be more like an art installation. He talked about wishing that he could start the piece and then have the audience come in. Sort of mm -hmm. things that he, that he wished he could, he could have done. Um, but the thing about, I don't know about this piece, but how he constructed this piece, but I know from the second quartet, that's five and a half hours, when he started writing it, he wrote for the Kronos Quartet, and he said, oh, I've got this piece, it's probably going to be about two and a half hours long. And then, how's the piece coming? Well, it's more like three. It's probably going to be about three and a half, you know? So, like, I don't know. So, I, I, he, I mean, only he would know, you know, when, how he decides when a, when a piece is, is done. But, I mean... Your, your question of like, yeah, like how long should the piece be and when should the piece end? It's a, it's a very complicated one. Yeah, I mean, we, we ask it all the time. We're like, well, um, I mean, sometimes we're like, well, why, uh, why don't we just not play some of these pages? Like, <laughs> like you know, how, how is it really going to impact it, you know? <laughs> um, but you know, really you know, here's the I thing, though. I never thought that in my life. No, but, here, but here's, a, here's the thing, just to... Just to put a different spin on it, like if you're if you're a painter, right? Like how large should your canvas be, right? I mean, are you painting something, you know, like this size or or that size? It's 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 a little it's completely it's a little bit completely subjective, right? Yeah, David, how do you decide? Yeah, <laughs> I think when the person who commissioned it is yelling at me because it's late, Don't I know it's over. <laughs> No, I, I do think, though, that, um, that basically big and small are things that we react to. And if you're a painter, um, I think someone can say, I'd like to work on a monumental scale, and we um, accept it as being monumental without measuring this monument is larger than that monument. 
So, so I think there's, there's no difference to me between this piece at 80 minutes and 100 minutes, but there's a big difference between this piece at 80 minutes and 40 minutes. Somehow, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure that's where the subjectivity comes in, but... Um, I also love the fact that this music is so intimate and all the changes are so tiny. It's almost like the music that takes place inside an atom. And so there's this little tiny world and yet it's happening on this huge kind of cosmic scale. So it's, the juxtaposition is rich. Uh, I, I was wondering about the experience you had in playing the piece. Uh, whether whether it changes each time you play the piece, uh, or whether you try to get instead a uh, sort of, uh, you know exactly what you're trying to achieve, but uh, it seemed to me that, that it was more organic and, and that, that uh, you were creating each gesture in a, in a kind of an organic way. And, and uh, I wonder if, if, if uh, it feels different on some nights than on others. And, and uh, uh, was this a good, you think this was a good, good performance for you? Vicki, <laughs> Vicki, you, you, you should answer that. I should? Yeah, because you've played this piece. Oh, yeah. well, we've all played the piece before, but we've never played it together until tonight. So it was really incredible really incredible to play with these guys. So, but for um, our first time together, it felt really um, magical for me. I mean, I think, I think like, it's not just this piece of music, I think all pieces of music should, there's, you sh there's, there should be room for spontaneity. Like, every performance should be different, right? I mean, there, things should not be like 100% strictly planned. Then, I mean, let's, What's, what's the fun in the, you know, you know, what's interesting about that, right? So, but, but then to add something, um, the repetitive aspect of this piece kind of makes it impossible for us to plan everything. <laughs> so, yeah. When I was playing it more a few years ago, we would always be astonished to check the runtime when we got off stage because the difference in times so between performance could vary as much as like eight minutes. So, it, and we were trying to play it the same, you know, pretty much as we had the night before, and yet there would be huge differences. So, especially with this music, I think it's it's impossible to replicate it exactly. Good one. So, eight, eight, eight minutes is like ten percent, right? Which, yeah. Yeah. So wait, we're actually tighter with string quartet too. We're only we're like within five percent. <laughs> Be humble, don't break. <laughs> um, this question is for David Lane. Um, I was totally riveted by the Little Match Girl Oratorio, and I found myself wondering if there's some of the same concept of like breathing or t temporality in your conception of that wonderful piece and how you see what they played tonight. I don't remember whether it's about the same length, but anyway, it just I haven't really formulated the question right, but do you know what I mean? Well, there's one way in which my piece, The Little Magical Passion, is very similar to this, which is that it's made up of a um, of very kind of simple materials that don't call that much attention to themselves, so that you can pay more attention to how things relate to each other and how much space they take and how much time they take. And I had this really interesting experience while I was writing it, because um, I wanted to tell this story that went from start to finish, and it's about 35 minutes long. Um, and while I was writing it, I wrote one section that had a really beautiful melody in it. And it was probably the most beautiful part of the piece. And it was so gorgeous. It really was, I, if I may say so, it was so beautiful. I couldn't ever write past it in the piece. Because at that moment, I would get there and I would go, oh, that, that is so fantastic. You know, nothing could possibly follow that. And so the way I solved the problem of the storytelling of the piece was to take the most beautiful part out. Because 
what happened was that at that moment, my experience listening to the piece was, oh, that's really gorgeous, that's really beautiful. This moment is really fantastic. But if you're trying to make a piece of music that tells a story from start to finish, you don't want people to pay attention to individual moments. You want people to pay attention to something over a long period of time. So nothing is wasted. I took that piece out and I used it someplace else. Um, but it was a really where, interesting lesson for me. Where should I look for it? <laughs> um, it's, it's in a piece called Where You Go, which um, the recording is not out yet, but if you can find it. But, um, but, but it was a really interesting lesson for me also, which is to say sometimes um, your obligation as a composer is to something that's larger than just whether or not something is beautiful. And maybe on that note, um, thank you all so much for coming and please thank our great players.